Hi, Michael. How are you? Hi. Um, well, <laughs> sorry, I had some trouble signing in. <laughs> yeah, no, I think everybody did. This was this is a Zoom specific dramas, but I've promoted you to panelists, so you are now promoted. <laughs> So I see that uh, people are coming into the webinar now. So we'll get started in just about a minute or two. Um, Michael, I haven't checked with you. Are you okay if we record the session? Of course, yes, no problem. Yeah. Thank you. So for those coming into the Zoom room, we're just going to get started in just about a minute. Well, I have uh, two past four, so just in the interest of time, I will get started. Tēnā uh, koutou katoa, ahi ahi marie, and I hope you are all doing well. Um, my name is Valerie Sitardi, and I am today's facilitator for the webinar called Data Down Under, a expert panel discussion on quantitative research in the Aotearoa New Zealand education sector. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer of educational psychology and quantitative research at the University of Canterbury in Ototahi Christchurch. Uh, and I'm also the co-founder for the new special interest group for quantitative studies with NZARE, so the New Zealand Association for Research in Education. So before we get started, I do want to just thank my SIG co-leaders, that's Tanya Evans from the University of Auckland, who's really the real brainchild of the SIG, um, and Robin Cagle at the Ministry of Education. Absolutely love working with you both, and I really appreciate your support and your enthusiasm on crazy ideas that I have like this one. Um, so I also do want to send special thanks to Brenda Frere at uh, NZARE, who helped us with the promotion of the event uh, and the registration process. So today um, we have a panel discussion and it's generally going to go like this. Um, we'll take a few minutes to give some introduction for our three different panelists. And I've prepared a set of questions for the panel to discuss. Um, we very well may not get through all of them, um, but my role here as the facilitator is to make sure that we stay on task and ensure that things run smoothly. Uh, the panels, obviously going to be offering their opinions and their ideas. Uh, and I very much appreciate that we may not agree on everything. Uh, and that's part of the kind of organic process. So I'm looking forward to a robust and constructive discussion. So depending on time, we may have some time for Q and A's at the end. Um, so if you are an attendee, welcome. And uh, please feel free to pop questions in the Q and A tab that should be either at the top or the bottom of the Zoom room. Um, if you're asking a question, we're not able to answer it. We will do our best to respond to you uh, after the event. Uh, and yes, this is being recorded. So if you need to pop out for whatever reasons, not a problem, uh, I will be emailing all of the registered attendees a recording of the event. All right, should we get started? Awesome. 
So I will uh, ask you, Michael, could you start first and just give us a quick introduction of who you are? Certainly. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michael Johnston. I'm currently a senior fellow at the New Zealand Initiative. Uh, uh, prior to joining the initiative a couple of years ago, I was at Victoria University of Wellington in the education faculty there for 10 years. And before that, I was a senior statistician at NZQA. I'm a cognitive psychologist by training. Uh, and so I got my induction into quantitative research th through that. Great. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, kia ora koutou. Hei nui amihi kia koutou. Um, I'm Stuart McNaughton. I'm, um, as the slide says, I'm a professor at the University of Auckland, but the majority of my time is spent as the uh, chief um, education science advisor as part of the Forum of Science Advisors across the agencies. Um, I've been doing that since 2014. Uh, like Michael, I have a background in uh, psychology, but specifically developmental psychology and educational psychology. Uh, and most recently, before I became the science advisor, uh, I um, directed a research center, which was very focused on school-based partnerships and and trying to contribute to um, design-based research with those schools. Thanks. Agate, could you? Um, Agate. Um, oh, Agate, sorry. Uh, 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 so, kia ora, um, koto Agate Pondra Sutton Toko Inoa. Um, hi. I'm Agate Ponder Sutton, and I'm the Chief Data Scientist for the Ministry of Education. I am the odd person out here because I am a quant person. My background is machine learning, statistics, and um, and and applied mathematics. I came to educate to the Ministry of Education uh, from running a, a machine learning ops team at Chorus. And then before that, I was a data scientist at BNZ. And before that, I taught data science at Massey um, University in Albany. And so I've been in data science and in machine learning uh, for 25 years. And um, my, my background touches on social science and psychology. But largely, I end up doing the quantitative side of things. Um, so I'm quite interested in education and I have taught um, elementary and preschool in the States as well as uh, high school in the States and university here. Um, this, I, I'm quite invested in education and so I'm, I'm quite interested to try and lend uh, a bit of a, a counterbalance uh, and, and quantitative methods. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I have, like I mentioned, I have a, a set of questions that I've prepared and um, they very well may be completely derailed and we may go on tangents and hopefully we do that. Um, but I do have some structured questions. Um, so thank you again to start. So the very first questions I have here, I think we're gonna hit kind of hard and quick. Um, I think it's kind of important for us to think very early on in terms of what what does the landscape look like in terms of quantitative research um, here in Aotearoa, with specifically to the uh, education sector. So the questions that I have posed for us to start with, but please feel free to evolve, um, are listed on the screen. So the first one says, what are some of the most pressing tensions or conflicts that you've observed in the realm of quantitative research in New Zealand's education sector? So that could be early childhood, the compulsory sector, or tertiary. Uh, and I'd also like us to think a little bit about how do you perceive the balance between traditional quantitative methods and other methodologies um, within the New Zealand research landscape? Who would like to start? I can, I can start if you like. Um, I'll probably go for the second point first, because uh, I think it's not, for me, it's not so much a matter of tensions and conflict. There's just not enough quantitative research taking place in education. So, you know, as I said, I, I, I 
was 10 years at Victoria University. I, I started in 2011 there. And I was quite taken aback at, about how little quantitative research was taking place in that uh, group of academics. And, and I came to discover that it wasn't really very different at any other university in, in New Zealand. I know there are some quantitative researchers, but really they're not uh, at the forefront of, of education research in, in New Zealand. And I, I think that's a real problem. It's, it's not to denigrate qualitative research, but I, I do think that uh, if we're going to use research in a generalizable way, then we need to have a quantitative backbone to it. I, th I think that qualitative research is useful to, to dig deeper in some ways. But uh, if we want to evaluate programs and interventions, which I think we should do a lot more of, then we need to develop uh, capability in, in quantitative methods and quantitative research and, and apply it much more broadly than it is at the moment. Uh, and as to why it's so out of balance, I'm not entirely sure, but I think that for whatever reason, education faculties in the country have been situated in humanities most of the time and, and don't have as strong a links to statistics uh, uh, schools or, or to psychology schools as they might. So I'll, I'll leave it there for the moment. So Valerie, I can't see Agat um, on my screen for some reason, so I, I, I really question. don't want to, I don't want to, I'll, I'll fiddle with my screen in a minute, but so I don't really want to talk across the other panellists. Um, I would largely agree with Michael's observations. Um, I don't really have that much to add, except, uh, except a couple of things. I think um, what I've seen sometimes in, in faculties is a misrepresentation of of um, the role and the and the potential contributions that our quantitative methods could make to solving our really pressing uh, problems. And what I mean by that is that I I, th I think there's an issue to do with those of us who might use those tools being able to show that uh, we can contribute in useful and and really productive ways to, as I say, the solving of these serious and pressing problems that um, that we want to solve in education. So I think there's a bit that's on us as users and and um, and uh, promoters, if you like, of quantitative methods to be able to make that demonstration. But that would that's the only thing I would add to Michael. So I really feel like um, it's so much easier to do smaller scale work, and that is oh, probably a large contributor to the fact uh that we see more qualitative work than we see quantitative work just to get the kind of power that you want out of a statistical test i mean we're going to be much more comfortable like as a statistician as a as a machine learning person i'm so much more comfortable with 5000 with 50000 with 100000 with hundreds of thousands of results than i am with four and also, I, I I do notice that we don't teach a lot of the smaller uh, scale methods uh, for quantitative um, tests. Um, they are they are things that you you learn after, especially. And also, we don't do um, we don't tend to teach uh, non parametric methods. We tend to leave them for last. Um, when really, if if we were to tackle this as a, okay, so we're going to be dealing with smaller numbers, we're going to be dealing with possibly unbalanced samples, like we don't probably want to normalize this back, like we want to um, talk to the, we, you know, we want to uh, confront that um, head on, like we want to be able to teach those in ways that aren't trying to pretend that any of that is rocket science. Um, because these are th these are methods people do, and they're not that hard. We don't need to make it that like we don't need to make this mountain harder to climb than it is already. So it sounds then, would we agree that there the one of the challenges that we're facing right now is that there's simply a matter of not having enough quantitative researchers in the country? Would that be fair? In education, I think that I think that's right. Um, and I don't think there's a great oh well, in my experience, there wasn't much 
taught at all in 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 the degrees at Victoria. So I, I taught part of a research methods course for the Masters of Education. Mm -hmm. uh, there was basically nothing at all in the in the undergraduate degrees. Uh, so I had oh, about three weeks of that course, uh, and I was teaching people who didn't necessarily have any background at all in, in quantitative research. So I had to start from the beginning. Uh, so really, it was all I could do in that time was, was to give them uh, a little bit of a, a an entree into how it worked. So I tried to teach about sampling distributions and how they worked. And I used the t-test as a model because it's a simple one to get your head around. Um, and I did something on a two-way analysis of variance so that they could understand what an interaction was. And that 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 was more than enough for that amount of time. And a few of them would then go on and do some do a research project, usually with me in um, using quantitative methods, but most of them were fairly glad to see the back of that part of the course, I suspect. Uh, so it, it is a real challenge. We're, we're starting from a very low base. Okay, I have an opinion here. And I'm willing to, uh, like, this is 100% my opinion and my soapbox. I think we teach that math is hard. Mm -hmm. And I think we teach that statistics is difficult. Um, and that that starts far before your quantitative methods oh, yes. class, Michael. I yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. I have I have taught that I've taught the beginnings of that class where all you're trying to get through is like a t test, so we can talk about some frequentist stuff. I can't even get to non parametric met methods if if you don't understand that like we're going to talk about frequency here. Mm. Yeah, so one, of the, one of the things that we're seeing then is it so there's a um, is it an imbalance between what is being taught in the universities and then therefore we're not having enough quantitative researchers? Well, well, as a gate says, it is a gate, is that, is that right? Have I got that no, right? No, it's agate. Agate, sorry. Oh, yeah. As agate, agate says, it, it goes back to school. Uh, and whether it's that we teach that mathematics is hard or we just teach mathematics and numeracy poorly, uh, then people get the idea that it's hard because they don't learn it very well and, yeah. and to be clear you know it's not the easiest subject to teach because you, one has to have a, a solid grasp of uh the issues with cognitive load wh whether you understand that theory explicitly or, or implicitly as, as good teachers do things have to be staged pretty carefully or people get left behind mm -hmm. they get buried in the in in the detail and and if if we don't bring students along at, at the pace that they can cope with, then they will feel that it is hard because for them it is hard and yes. then they won't want to do it anymore and they'll conclude they're no good at that. Mm. Uh, and tragically, too many of our primary school teachers, as a Royal Society report a few years ago showed, uh, fear and don't much like mathematics themselves. So we've got a real issue there going right back to primary school in, in how numeracy is taught and then how mathematics is taught. So there there are multiple dimensions to this problem. What what's your view about that, Stuart? Um well I, I agree I agree with the characterization of the the low confidence in maths and the and the worry about having the right knowledge to be able to teach maths and that it re is reflected in our initial teacher education foci in various ways. But I've been sitting here thinking about what would what would an appropriate pedagogy look like for teaching, for example, statistics? Now Spiegelhalter, who's um, what what is his wonderful title? Something about the fruit, um, forensic statistician, Oxford or Cambridge, and um, he he praises our curriculum and stats because it's problem focused and it almost in some respects in a in the hands of a good teacher embodies the idea of the local the local curriculum and the local context and to go back to my opening comment i don't think that we that we teach as well as we might how on earth our tools might contribute to the things that actually matter in the classroom uh, in education more generally an example of that might be um you know, things, the things that are taxing us at the moment, um, which range from, Michael, as you know, the literacy questions, numeracy, 
uh, taking uh, uh, taking programs that quote unquote work to scale these sorts of things and how our how our tools would, would help us solve how to do some of those things uh, better and to be able to critique um, the tools in a way that that enabled us to convey what they lack and hence what other methods and what, what other approaches are absolutely essential if we're going to have a combined um, collective expertise. Example here is I, when I was taught statistics and for a large part of my early career, the central tendency ruled everything. So you're looking for averages, you're looking for um, you know, the, the, the effect size of all effect sizes, the effect size to rule all effect sizes. Whereas I've also learned through design-based research and other things that we should be celebrating the variability because in the variability, you see, you see some of the examples of exemplary implementation or exemplary instruction, and we better understand that, and and uh, that might be a way of leading other approaches, more qualitative, more grounded approaches to 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 understanding what it is that those outliers might be doing. So to get back to my point, I think there's an issue in our pedagogy to do with demonstrating use contribution and complementarity. Yeah. Something to say there? I thought you were nodding. <laughs> so Stuart, would it be fair to say that you're 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 saying that it we could be doing better and that possibly some of the things that we're missing are the joy? Yeah, there you go. In the subjects. How about that? The joy. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, the pleasure, the intentionality of, but and, and I, I sound like a cracked record. I'm, I'm keen to get across the idea that we have a kisse. You know, we, we, we have a toolkit of, um, of various approaches and, and means of solving the problems, um, engaging in the, in the educational sciences. And, and that to me seems to be the, the nub of the issue we are unbalanced at the moment and it, i don't i want to say that we we bear some of the responsibility for that and uh possibly through our pedagogy without denying uh, michael's absolutely fine point that um, there is an issue to do with how we teach maths from year yeah. one i mean uh, when we talk about statistics we we have to be clear on what we mean because there are, there are different levels on which it can be taught and used of course and and so i mean for example uh for a while i was uh, in a teaching on a, a master's course for aspiring school leaders and one of the things that i did there was to uh, teach them about how to use assessment data from their school and they, they did a project that was a, a real project based on a real problem their school had and they had to select some data that were going to help them address it. And then we'd learn the methods that they needed to do that. And, and that was very successful. But And I think that goes to your point, Stuart. It was meaningful to them. It was in their local context and it had a, an actual point to it. Uh, I started off the first time I taught that course, I, I think too technical. Uh, and in the end, I'd, I ended up just moving to, well, as you mentioned central tendency and, and also variability me measures of those two things and and just very simple methods that you can get an awful long way on. And that was that was enough for, for them to get quite a lot of meaning out of that uh, that approach. On the other hand, it, you know, to delve more deeply at a systems level, using things like the integrated database and and I get probably some of the the databases you've got access to, there you can't avoid quite a lot of sophisticated statistics and and so it, we can't think that we can teach everything in a in a completely contextualized way because there are some abstract ideas that you really need to get your head around if you're going to go into that that much more advanced kind of analysis which we need as well and that's where the data scientists come in and the and the the mathematical statisticians and so on so i think there is a a tension between making things contextualized which statistics does lend itself to and uh, achieving the appropriate 
level of abstraction for those who are going to go on to to use the more advanced approaches and that's something we need to think through carefully that's a that's a good point michael but perhaps um, i better check with um valerie whether you want to shift uh, shift, shift to another slide but just just very quickly to pick up on a point that uh, michael made about um about uh almost if you like there's a paper about science which is like this which came out of nzcer that um, peter gluckman also contributed to which talks about um like citizenship science and and a, the requirement in a curriculum to be able to develop um general skills for all students that enable us to interact and engage with at, a, at the level you were talking about um science productions you know research that's relatively popularly uh, presented but also be critical and, and be able to pick the misinformation etc and those who might be going on a more academic or a longer term trajectory around the more abstract and there probably is a similar way of thinking about um the the primary curriculum and the secondary curriculum sorry uh, uh valerie i was just thinking that uh, that was a point worth making no, I totally agree. I think one of the things that I'd actually like us to to think about is maybe if we scope out just one more level. I'm curious if any of you have actually had pushback when trying to discuss quantitative research within the sector. Agate, um, not not. I mean, I mean, I've had pushback speaking about quantitative methods within the ministry, not in a big way, but in a um, making making it useful. You know, you want to be able to like, yes, it is a highfalutin model. That's great. What's it mean? Mm -hmm. And and actually, I think that that's really important. And it's actually all to the point that Stuart was and, and Michael were have just been making it. But I don't know. I think that we need to like, and one of the things I've been conversations I've been having is been about you don't have to know all the math to have a gut feel for the higher end of it, and that we can we can teach like some of the gut feels for the higher ends of things so that you can begin to know like does that feel right? Do I need to get somebody with more statistical gut? You know, do I need to get more statistical uh, nous involved in this project? Mm. Um, I mean, you can get an awfully long way on on some pretty simple methods. Yeah, totally, Michael. Yeah. But to be able to say, you know, yeah, this looks like it might be skewed. That might change my answer. That I feel is it still simple, but begins to point you towards higher end things. Like you can begin to go, ah, this might be beyond what I what I really know well. It might be time to get someone else. Yeah, yeah. That that's a thing I've been a conversation I've been having within the ministry, um, to sort of support that like push between like how much how how technical do you need to be. Uh, quantitatively. Yeah, you don't need a cleaver when you need a butter knife. Yeah, <laughs> like you, you you don't need something super technical. And, and actually half the time, I don't use anything that's super technical, but I do know when they're like, oh yeah, no, that now is the time to get the other kete, open that one. You know, all the technical, the super technical things live over here. Whereas, you know, we're going to start by checking averages. We're going to make sure the distribution doesn't look too weird. So I'm going to push us along to then kind of the next kind of discussion here, which is is kind of about where could we be going, right? So we've, we've talked a little bit now about kind of the, the landscape, the situation that we're kind of working with within the sector. So I'd like your thoughts uh, in terms of kind of given the landscape, uh, what do you guys see as the most kind of significant opportunities for growth or innovation within quantitative research over the next 10 years or so? Um, and if we what we can do to keep quantitative research relevant and adaptable, um, even though we have a very evolving uh, landscape here. 
The, the the opportunities for growth are enormous because we're starting from such a low base. Uh, the, almost anything we do, you know, could stand to improve things. So we've already talked about a little bit about uh, mathematics teaching in schools. We need to focus on that. Uh, I think upskilling primary school teachers in in numeracy pedagogy and knowledge, uh, pedagogical content knowledge. This is this is essential so that we've actually got. Uh, people coming through, young people coming through who are capable of taking on more advanced studies and statistics and so on. Not, not that all of them need to become advanced, but that that option would be there for them and that they don't see it as too daunting. I think big data has a huge amount to offer. We we have got that integrated database that we could, we could be exploiting far more than we are to, to be looking at the effectiveness of our education system and its flow on effects into employment and and participation in society and so on. Uh, certainly the Education Academy could benefit from a great deal more focus on quantitative studies. Uh, I'd like to see the ministry, whenever it is planning something new and big, to plan a, an evaluation alongside it, that it would either conduct itself or commission the New Zealand Council for Education Research to to do or or a, 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 some academics or whoever that that is part and parcel of a new, a new push whether it's a new curriculum uh, innovation or uh, a new pedagogical innovation or something like the you know you know I did I did this report a, a year ago on the modern learning environments and I was it was quite jaw dropping to find that there was no evidence base at all behind it uh, yes. and certainly no plan to evaluate its effectiveness or anything like that so really that should be part and parcel of everything we do is how effective it is and a large part of that should be quantitative measurement based uh, not not all of it the qualitative side can be there too of course but at the moment again it's out of balance now I've got a couple of thoughts um, around that question uh, Valerie, the one, if I can um, use uh, Michael's comment again as a segue, um, we have, we do really need to build a, a, a much stronger culture with a small C culture of uh, research and evaluation, research and development. Uh, that's not just on the, um, on the Ministry of Education, but it's generally across our sector. And one of the, and this is going to sound terribly parochial and, and whinging almost, but one of our problems is we are such a poor cousin to other agencies and other, and other funding sources. Uh, for example, in the current RSI landscape, research, science and innovation landscape, um, health research, probably when you count up MB funded and health research council funded stuff, probably is around $380 um, million. Well, if you add up our TLRI and a few other bits and pieces, we might get to somewhere between 30 and $40 million uh, per annum I'm talking about. I mean, we we have a problem to do with scale and we have a problem to do with, um, as it were, the default being the culture of evaluations. So I really strongly support that, but we need to look to go to your point, your, your question. We need to look for the where the opportunities do exist. Now, I don't know what the history of um, uh, Te Ara Pairangi and the national research priorities will be following the election, but uh, currently uh, there are um, there is in development a set of national research priorities, and we should make sure educational sciences are front and centre there, are well represented in some in some form or another. And I know the ministry has been providing some input as far as uh, the development of those priorities might be concerned. Um, I do think that there is huge opportunity around the databases, um, as Michael points out, and this is Agatha, this is a largely your your work as well. So I'm going I'm I'm going to um, I'm going to bow to your expertise in a moment or two. But yes, the IDI, the integrated data infrastructure, we could be using that. I like you, um, Michael, I was appalled recently because uh, when I thought about what we know about teacher education, you know, the, the report that you developed, there is so little evidence that we have about um, effectiveness of retention patterns and causal relationships around all of that. And why, in goodness name, 
and what might we do about it? We have dropping FTEs in, in terms of the undergraduate program in the B.Ed., et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And ultimately, we should be we should be doing the research and research and development and evaluation that provides the evidence base for us to make the really good decisions. I do think there are opportunities coming up around using the IDI for that. Um, there are opportunities with large databases like the Growing Up in New Zealand study. But the last thing I would say is um, I think we have opportunities around the partnerships. Now, I know we're going to talk about this um, a bit later on, perhaps, but the partnerships with schools, I, which I, I know best, are a, are a huge opportunity for us to be able to contribute to the ways in which schools solve design, redesign, um, effective education pedagogy for themselves. So there are huge opportunities through the, the partnerships that we should be engaged in. Agata, as I said, this is really your purview. So I, my apologies for taking up time. Okay. So many cans of worms. Um, so little time. Right. Um, Michael, I have read your study on um, on modern classrooms and I have actually picked up work within the ministry to evaluate them and we don't have a complete list of them. No, I realized that. Yeah, at the time. Yeah, was... and, and that's one of the reasons that that work got shelved mm. because I can't tell without ringing each individual school. That, what... I mean, that's an issue in itself, though, isn't wow. it? The ministry yeah, doesn't no, collect and, the raw and, data. Where I'm sitting with that is that's that's a that's a we need to build trust with our schools that we're not going to do deeply creepy things with their data that we have their best interest at heart that we really yeah. are trying to do our very best for New Zealand um and that when we have when we take when we have their data we are guardians of it not not going to squander that particular time um but so we could be doing amazing things if all of our data linked up um, and I would love to see that. I would love to see quite a bit more in the IDI. There is this really great, um, <laughs> really great initiative that I have to tell you I am part of so that I, I definitely have a hand in. So I am biased, but I think it's great. It's uh, the IDI uh, Betterment um, project and it's, we're writing modules to use in the IDI so that when I do educational attendance, and I pull the numbers in the IDI, you can use the same code I did so that we can share that so that when OT pull the numbers from education, when education pulls the numbers from OT or IRD or wherever else, and then we before we anonymize, we can know that we're pulling the data in the same way that the ministry who owns that data would pull it. Um, and that we're working, trying to work collaboratively across the ministries to be able to support this work within the IDI to make sure that the data is more useful. I would love to see that uh, more highly subscribed. Um, we could be doing we could be doing so many more things if we did if, if we had more trust from the schools that we know we're, we're going to do good things with your data internally. And if we if more people knew that there was the IDI betterment. Um, uh, project that they could use externally um, and in the IDI with all of that fabulous data um, to be able to leverage that. And so, but I wanted to bring it back to the original question was about where we want to, where we think we're going and where growth and innovation are. I want to see us teach AI because I write machine learning. That's, that's what I'm trained to do. I am very good at that. I'd like to have us teach that in a way that scares people less and is more informative. I'd like to see teachers use it as a tool to teach both the biases inherent in those models and what it might possibly be good for to their students. I'd love to be able to have that be a thing that we could provide. I'd love to be able to have automation within the research 
and I'd love to, to be able to do so. Not just AI, but AI adjacent things that are take less work, but maybe teachers are asking for that we could automate, we could like do studies and say, what are the biggest pain points? And then we could see about, I don't know, automating those things. So we've got a lot of different pieces to pull together then. Yeah. So like we've got we've got the the kind of growth and and innovation that's taking place generally speaking within any education sector. Yes. Right? We've we've also got the kind of challenge of like um, I guess it's bureaucracy in terms of data that isn't totally. that aren't being linked together. And then there's also, you know, perceptions of siloing, right, within different institutions, mm -hmm. different organizations, and not necessarily working together per se. Yeah. Um, and I, and I that, think that is the beauty of the IDI, though, is that it does connect yeah. up the data across all the different agencies and and it's there for people to to use so that but it, i mean it does take a fair bit of training to be able to use it and, and so there's a, there's a an issue there uh, exactly michael and one of the problems has been that when education hold it we we know educate we know atta educational attainment and we know uh, attendance so when we pull it we will change we will it will be different to how anyone else might use that data and there are tips yeah. and tricks we can share yeah. in the IDI about that. And yeah. I really want to see that done. I, I, I don't want to harp on the modern learning environment Sorry. one again, but it, it's 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 a good kind of case study in the sense that, you know, I mean, you, you're saying, I get that the, the schools might not want to, you know, part with their data. They might, they might not trust the ministry or whatever, but really, uh, to my mind, there should have been a pilot study of that approach, you know, long before we spent, I think it was two and a half billion dollars on, on building these things. So they, they should have tried it out in, in 10 schools or something like that and, and designed a study to see whether this the, this kind of learning environment was the kind of place that kids learn well and compare it, you know, with, with other kinds of learning environments and then to see whether it was actually worth doing the full-blown thing here we are you know it, 10 years it wasn't on. That I, I i i forgive me i i think there was um of that particular one but like okay hold on so it's when when schools aren't completely sharing all of their data i think you might have uh, there might be a bit of gloss happening there i don't necessarily think that the reason like that the only reason that i don't have complete data on every school is a lack of trust i think that that's multitudinous right you know some schools are small and it's not necessarily if you don't know what the data is going to be used for it's not necessarily going to be your highest priority to make sure that the data that comes to the ministry is perfect right um so there's that and there's like a, a history of not the best interactions between the ministry and the schools and you know we're funding and um, the per the person that teachers bargain with, so it's it's a complicated relationship. So I can see why we were where we are, and I'm not really I'm not cross about it. I'm just saying we need to build trust in at least our guardianship of that data, um, and and that we're going to use it for good things. Um, and also we need to keep in mind that the ministry is at the whim or at the very specific request of the minister. We do the things we're told and the, we do the things we've promised to report on. So I guess that brings in the, the dimension of uh, the political work required oh, yeah. to, to get by and at government level to, to push things a bit further. And I guess, you know, sure. from the point of view of collecting data from schools, probably we could build some infrastructure to make it easier for them to report data totally i think that would be such a good idea those sorts of developments have been underway haven't they um, in, yeah, in various um, in various forms within the ministry but uh, but but there's a piece that you've been involved in and the ministry has been taxed by in a way i mean it's a, a significant challenge and that's around the sovereignty of the data um who owns it what rights do, um, and particularly in 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 the in the framing of of being Tiriti led now stats NZ who 
quote unquote owns the IDI has got some very good protocols which they've developed appropriately in partnership. They may be weak in certain respects and they, and they may not be fulfilling all the obligations necessary, but we, we really do need to make sure we have those things right yeah. in order in order for us to proceed around, particularly around the issue of trust. Yeah. And and I, yeah, as I say, I, I recognise the work that you and others are doing within the ministry to enable that to happen. Thank and you, Stuart. So um, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Valerie. No, I was just going to say that's no easy feat. I mean, so in, in terms of kind of, um, I, I think we're obviously talking quite a bit about collaboration and partnerships. So we've got We've got, we want to make sure that our schools and, and our uh, early childhood centers and our institutions are, are all um, actively encouraged and supported and valued in the research process because very easily can they become lost in, you know, in the muddle of everything. Uh, but we also, at the same degree, want to make sure that the universities and the academics who are conducting research are working with the ministry and that like the ministry, which is like you said, kind of at the whim of the ministry and and what the political du jour is, um, you know, how can we how can we work together? Because I think I've been here in New Zealand for ten years, and so for those who've been here for longer, correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels as though there's not a long um, long standing partnership and relationship between uh, ministry and what's taking place in policy with uh, academics, with schools. And so sometimes feel, things feel quite s segmented. Um, that's my own observation. But, um, you know, I guess I'm curious to, to the panelists, are we forgetting anyone else? Are we forgetting other groups that we need to bring into the discussion? Well, I, 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 in a different report, recommended that the quantitative capability of the New Zealand Council for Education Research be expanded. So they do really good psychometrics work. They have some good quantitative people there, but there's not enough of them. Uh, and and really outside of the psychometrics work, they do some surveys, but they don't, they're not really commissioned to do large scale quantitative evaluations, for example. So, so there's another organisation that I think we could uh, get a bit more out of. Yes, and there's um, there is the potential for partnerships, um, as Agat was was noting in a way uh, within and between agencies, and and one agency that's very well set up for us to work uh, with, and particularly around the large data sets, is the Social Wellbeing Agency, and they have some very good capability there to ask questions that are. Um, and answer <laughs> answer questions as well um, that are that are of the day. So, for example, they did a recent um, uh, report using using the IDI and, and a sort of a, a, um, a propensity uh, matching design to answer the question about um, the longer term outcomes of alternative education. Now, they can do this in a number of ways. So, they could ask questions about the longer term outcomes of different configurations of teacher ed programs they could uh, ask and answer questions uh really uh, if we had the if we had the identifiers michael which i note uh answer questions about different designs for schools um such as the modern learning environments so we don't have to reinvent the wheel we we can work in partnerships but valerie to your question an obvious partnership is the partnership with um, Māori agencies and Māori organisations, um, there's a there's a very good statement by um, Tahu Kokatai and others on uh, called Te Putahitanga around um, a Tiriti led science policy um, uh, uh, capability in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and and clearly a, a really strong advocacy there a very strong uh, concern about the partnerships with various um iwi uh, uh, uh maori groups not just at iwi level but at other levels of course so uh, i don't know that we've been very good as quantitative researchers within research teams of uh, doing that do we think that there are any um any tensions there in terms of the, the kind of nature of quantitative research 
um, in terms of how the scientific method is approached in terms of inviting collaborations with Ely uh, and with Mahdi partnerships? Do we have kind of issues with regards to getting um, collaborative efforts there? Others, as I say, for example, the authors of Te Putahitanga could answer that question really well. My my offer would be to say it depends on the questions and it depends on who's asking the questions and who benefits from the questions. So it's not could quantitative methods be intention or could they be not intention? The question is who owns the question? Who's asked the question? Who, um, you know, who, who, is there is there a, a, a real and authentic and a and a partnership sort of model in place that would enable whatever is learned, whatever is quantified to be able to be used for the good of the collective? I'd take it back to the um the teaching and in, in schools again as well. So so ideally, you know, if you wanted to if the if 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 an agency was Approaching an iwi uh, to undertake some research in partnership with them, perhaps, wouldn't it be great if there were some statisticians who were members of that iwi? And maybe sometimes there are, um, but it, to the extent that there are not, that that may have to do with uh, Maori struggling in 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 school education in in numerate disciplines, and we've seen recent data that show that too many of them do. Uh, and and I'd take that back again to the teaching methods that we use. Uh, so if we use unstructured and ineffective teaching methods, if primary school teachers lack enough pedagogical content knowledge in mathematics and numeracy, then that the 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 disadvantage of that is going to fall most heavily on disadvantaged students, uh, of whom too many are Maori. So. Uh, if we look to once again those methods and if we can improve them then maybe you know over time iwi are going to be able to speak for themselves about quantitative methods because they'll have quantitative researchers who are members of the of their of those groups of people Agat, did you have something you wanted to say yeah um so one of one of my my favorite data scientists, one of my favorite machine learning experts in New Zealand uh, is Ernestine Walsh and she's, she's Maori. And so I think, and she's the tip, the very tiniest tip of the iceberg. There's so many more. I think there, we can be pairing with and saying, hey, these are the questions we think we need to be asking. A, are they the right questions? Yeah. I, I think that's a really good place to start. Is are these the right questions? Are these questions that speak to you? I think these are the ones that we need to be answering. Are they like, does that does that work on, you know, for you as well? Because it is sometimes I find when you collaborate with someone just that tiny bit of turning the question and then it actually really gels for both you and them and you can actually get that interaction um let's see here so there's a bit of that there are um there are quantitative folks within the ministry and actually the number of uh, projects that you brought up, Stuart, um, that we've actually worked on and shelved because we don't have the data, um, but also that that's different. Um, so, yeah, we, we need to just be more collaborative across the board. And I think that you're pointing us in the correct direction with the community engagement. Valerie, I see that slide. And yes, I think that's where we want to be going, is finding ways to support and amplify the work of our quantitative researchers, no matter where they are, being able, but also I would say connecting them um, and connecting across um, across ministry, across iwi, across uh, New Zealand, so that we can actually have a really solid Aotearoa answer or set of answers. I, I, I think that that's probably um, 
one of the best ways to start is that, yeah, if we could in invite teachers as citizen scientists, if we can invite iwi as citizen scientists, people to be able to engage with their own education and the education um, net or sea of, of that we have in New Zealand, that might be a really great, great place to start finding those ways up uh, for for ourselves. Yeah, so it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a um, egg and chicken kind of thing. Mm, totally because, right. Because like we have we don't have enough quantitative researchers to really um, you know as much as we would like. I think collectively, yeah. um, we we would like to grow that community. Um, but how do you? Where do you start? Right. So like trying to get the schools and teachers involved is fabulous. Like I, I yeah. found that, that one of the most beneficial ways and fulfilling, too, because you have a real connection with with the people who are having an impact on the educational research. Um, but it's also the challenge is like, how do we how do we start? Do I mean, yes, obviously, starting with really good maths education and teaching statistics is that's a long term ambition. I would hope that would be shorter than long, but. But, but oh, what, yeah. what, what when I'm talking about do. teaching statistics, I mean, actually, at our level now, you were a researcher in education. OK, well, then we need to may, maybe we can see about things like it, it, NZIRE's quantitative methods um, uh, conference where we're going to actually talk about quantitative methods. And maybe we could do some some lighter courses that talk about, OK, so you've got so, so you've got yourself some messy data. How are you going to sort that? Yeah, I mean, I, I can I can probably speak to that in terms of what the the SIG is hoping to achieve is is uh, you know Tanya has really kind of been kind of spearheading this and and kind of identifying that like we don't really have a very um, strong um, integrated community in terms of quantitative research. I mean, I can speak to that as being like at Canterbury where there are, it's a much fewer proportion of quant researchers in education, whereas other institutions have a, a larger proportion. But the idea here that we've, we're trying to achieve with the SIG is to kind of bring us all together, but also to use it for like, for good. And to like, we'd like to run workshops and professional development for, um, for members of NZARE, but also for educators and teachers and Kayako and you, whoever it is, to give like basics on quantitative research and mixed methods research, um, but also to, to kind of help with promoting collaborative work because it's just so easy for things to stay isolated. It's a really good point, Valerie. You know, when, when there's one or two quantitative researchers at best in, in each university, faculty of education, it, it, you know, making connections across is really important. So I think that the the new group is really important and will make an important contribution in that because it 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 keeps people feeling more connected and not not so demoralized and as if they're they're just isolated in, in what they're doing. So I think it's a wonderful innovation. Yeah. Another another little part, um, little piece of the jigsaw are uh, our internships. Uh, particularly with an agency like the Ministry of Education or the Social Wellbeing Agency, as I mentioned, um, Agate, we've had some tremendous interns uh, that have come in for six months or three months and done work on databases and and um, uh, and uh, you know, associated educational issues or policy issues that the ministry is working on, and and these are specific for Māori and Pacifica. Um, our students and they work tremendously well because of this. I mean, it's a bit like the pedagogy point I was trying to make earlier because these are real questions that can lead to real answers or at least part part answers um, and have a have a potential impact uh, contributing to solutions. So um, think about. I don't know that we have a very good raft or a very good in integrated sort of sense across across um, uh, our sector on where the internships are, where the scholarships are, how we could be promoting uh, from emergent researchers and, and, and um, you know, undergraduates and whoever uh, the expertise that is needed to contribute. 
I know that I've had chats with uh, with Gavin Brown in the past, and I think that uh, in I believe it's in Sweden they have a specific institution, an institute I think that is for quantitative research in uh, education. And so it's a bit of a consortium where there are people from different institutions all collaborating in one major focus. Uh, and of course, I'm not quite sure whether there's appetite in, in Aotearoa for that, but like, I think just trying to be able to, to organize and, you know, work together, I think is really essential, but I don't know. So an interesting idea, Valerie. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it would be really exciting. <laughs> Yeah, right. I have to get beyond some of the, uh, um, I don't know, structural problems, which are to do with the competitive nature of some of our research. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we need we need to find better ways of of working together rather than competing for a limited funding pool. Yeah, I mean that. That's one, what one of the one of the the kind of disappointments of the mergers of the teachers colleges into the universities has been that they didn't take as much advantage as they might have uh, as being now situated in universities and collaborating with other uh, disciplines so some of that happens but not nearly enough and and we we could see much more collaboration with uh, academic statisticians and uh, experimental psychologists and so on within within the universities with with the education faculties, but that that isn't happening and or not in any great scale. And and again, that that could have to do with competition, but I think it's really just that nobody's ever really made it happen, or there's no kind of structural Im impetus to make it happen. Hmm. Yeah. I, actually, I, I'm I'm liking this idea. One of the things I was thinking as I've been as we've been talking is that that we also that there is a space for quantitative researchers in education to talk to other quantitative analysts or quantitative other statisticians or other uh psychologists um but i know they they don't not going to share your specific focus but i think continue like maintaining that bridge is totally important is uh michael one of the things that um, that I've noticed that you know, correct me if if it doesn't work, if it doesn't make sense to you guys, or if you if you disagree, um, is what I'm seeing is that there is uh, there's a lot of training in terms of data science more broadly. Like as a general discipline, data science seems to be doing really well in university programs and getting a lot of traction and getting people trained to be data scientists. So when we hire data scientists into the education sector, they may not necessarily have the discipline specific knowledge about what it's like to be in a classroom or to be a teacher. And we yeah. also have the other end when our people who are completing PhDs in education, but maybe they don't have any quantitative expertise, so they don't understand data science. So would it be fair, do you, do you guys see a similar you know, disconnect or is that just me? <laughs> Oh, 100 percent. Just um, I mean, as someone as someone who's done data science for a long time, one of the thi one of the continuing things that keeps my job interesting is learning a new field, is being able to pick up that new field and go, ah, yes. OK, so this is electricity or this is um, fiber or this is education. But education I feel is is so much more important than m many other of of the fields I've worked in um to be able to pick that up and understand like pedagogy and the 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 ways in which you can learn and teach and the things that we do for measurement um it might be worth like building that particular bridge as, as like a uh, as a beginning course um, both for from the end of you you finished your PhD and you did some stats, but you have no 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 formal uh, data science, or you've done all your data science, but you have no ideas about education. You've never taught, or maybe you've taught one course. What do you reckon, Stuart? Valerie? Well, well, it's a hard ask uh, for oh, somebody to have all of the above um, that you just mentioned. And yes, um, I've certainly seen the disconnect. Um, and you need, we need to be thinking in 
in some senses around distributed cognition of collective reasoning. Uh, what I what I observe sometimes is that we have a lot of data and not a lot of reason. And um, I've been keen to, you know, to promote the idea that there's a step beyond collecting the data and running our HLMs or whatever, which is to do with what on earth does it mean? And, well, and, and, what, and what do we want to know, right? I, I mean, yeah, one of the things I always I always start with when, when I'm teaching research methods is what do you want to find out? Don't don't start with what data to collect. That's afterwards. <laughs> First of all, you know, what do you want to you find want to out? Yes, but I, I was thinking, Michael, at this point of, of the things that we do uh, through the uh, Ministry of Education. So, for example, the national monitoring or the or the international assessments. So it's one thing to report, you know, the trend lines, the repeated measures, as I say, the central tendencies and all of the all of that. It's another thing to sit down and say, we've got this bit here from Pisa and we've got this bit here from Tim's and we've got this bit here from Pearls and we've got this bit here from NMSSA and 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 doing the narrative, making the story about that that is as evidence informed as it could possibly be. And you need many minds figuring that out. Um, it just is. It just is the case. Uh, um, case in point. Um, actually, uh, uh, the the drops in our achievement, for example, in Pearls or Pisa in particular, mostly occurred between about two thousand and nine and two thousand and twelve. And the question becomes, what is it about that time? It's not two thousand versus two thousand and eighteen. Yeah, there's a drop between those two extremes, but the drop actually took place two thousand and nine ish. So the question yeah. becomes, what do we know about what was happening socially, educationally, whatever, around that time that might have contributed to that drop? And that requires collective reasoning. And potentially reasoning from outside the education system yeah. as well, because, of course, the education system is situated within a, a larger society that has effects on what happens in education too. So, yeah. Yes, indeed. Absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Definitely, Stuart. We cannot eat your ghost chips. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yes. You know, we, we've had this conversation. Eh? Yeah, no, but 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 it is it in it, it it remains true. And 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 like I, I am right there with you about this completely. Um so Michael, you're the 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 the, the conversation Stuart and I uh have had at this point, I think twice, maybe thrice, Stuart. <laughs> do, do you want to sum it up? No, just that, um, about the meaning-making part of, of what we do and mm, how that requires yeah. resourcing and energy and, and time commitments. Um, and that's, again, a little bit on us as the quantitative, if we might be using quantitative tools, to be able to present the data that we've collected in ways that enable that meaning-making rather than undermine yeah. the meaning-making. and that was sort of behind my point about putting the variability together with the uh, with the central tendency, um, because both are sources of information that uh, modify um, or provide caveats for the other. So I'm just reminded as you're talking, Stuart, about so shortly to come out, there's a piece of research that's a white paper coming out of the ministry that talks about uh, trajectory. Um, it's done, it's um, Marion Loader. So it should be, it, it, she's just amazing. She's one of our internal analysts and she's just, she's top notch. So I really, I'm waiting with bated breath to see that. Um, and I know that we've done, I know the tertiary end of the ministry has just finished a white paper that talks about outcomes for underemployed uh young people and I, I it is on the tip of my tongue and i cannot remember the name of it um but it also seems very interesting it um so we're beginning we, we do the larger pieces but to be able to have it, so we are getting there Stuart. it's <laughs> just not as fast as we could get there if we all like lifted the boats together yeah but as i say it requires well, um, to go well, back to your previous us, yeah. point, uh, yeah, get it coming together, resource, time, 
focus, intentionality to be able to do that. Well, I think it comes, it all comes, I think Michael made the point, you know, that what is the research question? What do you want to know? But I also think like, it's actually, I would argue it's even one step further back. It's actually, what's the research problem? What's the issue that we're trying to, to address? And, and often that's the forgotten thing, especially when you're like, you know, data hungry and you're excited to start cracking into things. It's like, at least with my own kind of, with my own students, when I work with them, I'm like, so what's the problem that we're trying, what's the real life issue that we're trying to address? And it's often easy for us to forget that. Yeah. Valerie, um, I meant to, when you introduced us, to congratulate you um, and your team on on getting this thing up and running. I know others have congratulated you. And I've been thinking okay. here, it, w it could be a really good forum for, in fact, sharing of a lot of um, database projects, uh, ministry, um, uh, designed ministry run um, out of the research groups from various parts of the sector. You know the classic sort of posters and and uh, and, and presentations, but but just the networking around what we are all doing and how the, this might fit. So yeah, I, I didn't want to go away from this uh, podcast without saying well done and and. Um, Oh, thank you. I mean, like, really, it's all it's it's all Tanya's fault. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm very I'm very happy to be part of this. I think uh, it's exciting. You know, it 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 almost sometimes feels like you need to kind of build the community because otherwise it's just not going to to occur. Mm. I get to do have something you wanted to say. I'm <clears throat> I, I'm 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 catching um, the questions. Yeah, and. Um, Do we yeah. want to hit those first or, so, I mean, do you want to wrap here? Yeah, I think so. In so I'm just mindful of time. So I think maybe we could just create an entire podcast with the four of us and just do this regularly. <laughs> um, not that I'm like volunteering for it, but you know, um, like we got through just like a couple of the questions and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I do see we have questions in the Q and A, but I think just because we're wrapping up on time, um, I'll I'll hold off. I think people have put their names in there, um, and I will maybe have a chat with with the rest of the panelists, and we can just kind of address some of those questions after the fact. Um, so no, actually, I think that's a really good kind of point for us to to kind of close, if that's all right with you guys. Um, thank you to those who have attended and have have uh, hopefully have enjoyed the the discussion. Um, I appreciate those who have put in comments. Um, and I do also just want to thank the panelists again. I'm really, really grateful for your time uh, and your your enthusiasm. Um, and I, thanks to NZARE. I really sincerely hope to, to see everyone at kind of future SIG events and we're gonna be really annoying. So like, you're gonna see a lot of us um, because we really believe that it's, you know, it's an important cause. And, um, you know, I think there's so much opportunity for, you know, mounds and mounds of data that are collected and then either not used or used inappropriately. And then we don't get answers to those research questions. Um, so I, I'm I'm looking forward and optimistic. Uh, so thank you. Um, if the attendees have any questions, please feel free to send me an email at any time. Um, otherwise, I look forward to seeing everyone at NZARE's annual conference which will be in Palmerston North in about six weeks, which has just shocked me because I have lost track of what month we're in. Um, so thank you again uh, to the panelists and um, I hope everyone else has a wonderful day. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you again. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. My pleasure. Kia ora. Yeah, kia ora. Kia ora.